All right, so this is the last section that we have to cover before the BC exam. Um, and this is going to deal with the calculus of polar curves. We talked about in the first video for 10.3 exactly what a polar curve is and how it's defined and all that stuff. Um, and now we're going to look at actually both in 10.2 and 10.3 and we're going to look at now how we can actually use calculus with that. Alright, so this is a graph uh, that you can actually graph with the TI-89 or with any graphing calculator that will graph in polar because all this is is R equals 2 sine of 2.15 theta and you set your theta to go from 0 to 16 pi. So you're going around the circle eight times and that's where you get all these loops. And you got the 2.15 by theta which means that they're going to go around the circle as far as values even f faster. So that's why you get the multi loops and you get the little slide, the, the offset to them and all that stuff. So adjusting this number right here and this number right here adjusts how many of those loops you actually have. Adjusting the two is going to change how far out it goes. And when it's at its maximum value, that's when it's going to be the furthest out. So if you wanted to make this three, it would just be a bigger flower. But if you change this multiple in here, it's going to change how the loops perform going around. All right, now to find the slope of a polar curve at any value of theta, this is what you do. Remember, when we come back to slope, defined as we do, defining it as we do in rectangular coordinates of dy dx, we're going to have to take the derivative of y with respect to theta and divide that by the derivative of x with respect to theta. And then of course remember with the chain rule when we do this division we can keep change flip and the d thetas are going to take, at, take each other out so we have dy dx. And dy dx is the change in y over the change in x which is slope. So the thing is we kind of have a problem with our r well, I mean with our y and our x because, well, if we're dealing, dealing with polar, we don't really have that. So the way we find it is we take the r that we know and multiply it times sine theta. That is going to give us the y value. Remember that y is nothing more than r sine theta. If you go back and look at your original, hold on original equations when we defined uh, the unit circle values when we didn't have to, when we were not on the unit circle sorry I said unit circle values but the the values on any circle if you remember sine theta is nothing more than what y divided by the radius so here all we did was do what we took that thing right there and we solved it for y multiplied both sides by r. So r sine theta equals y. Same thing with our definition for r cosine theta. If you remember defining the uh, all the trig functions on any circle was nothing more than cosine equals x divided by r. So when we wanted to find and solve for x, all we have to do is multiply both sides by r. Now if r is 1, then it's not a big deal. But if r is something other than 1, then we can't just say that sine is always going to be y and cosine is always going to be x because that r does have something to say about it. But that's where these come from right here. When we define our trig functions on any circle, not just the unit circle. Now, if we use the product rule, because it's r times sine theta, we're going to get this thing right here. First times the root of the second. Actually, they got this backwards. Uh, plus second times the root of the first. They have this backwards from what we do uh, in the way we've probably learned it. But remember, when it's adding, it doesn't matter. 
All right, and then same thing down here, second times due to the first, that's going to give us this thing right here, uh, plus first times due to the second, the derivative of r, the derivative of cosine is going to give us negative sine, that's where that minus comes from. <clears throat> So that is the equation that we need to use and remember for the slope of a polar curve. A little bit of calculus in there. Now you can derive it if you need to. It's a little easier just to know this though. So for example, let's have r is equal to 1 minus cosine theta. That means that r prime is sine theta. And we just plug that sine theta in everywhere we had a r prime. And we plug in the 1 minus cosine theta everywhere we had an r. And then we simplify. So we've got sine theta times sine theta, there's sine squared theta. When you distribute this cosine theta through, you're going to get cosine theta minus cosine squared theta. And down here you're going to get something very, very similar, except you're going to actually end up mixing some problems here. But there's what you end up with. And we can use a little uh, combining like terms here and here to put those together. And a little rearrangement to move this together. And sine squared theta minus cosine squared theta is a double angle formula. So out of that we're going to get negative cosine 2 theta plus cosine theta. On the bottom, 2 sine theta cosine theta is also a double angle formula. So you get sine 2 theta minus sine theta. Guys, if you don't remember these properties, it's not that big a deal. If you were doing a problem like this, chances are pretty good that it's going to be a calculus problem, sorry, a calculator problem, or it's going to be something that you can actually plug the trig values in It'll be like pi over 4 or something that you can easily plug your trig values in right here and find out what the value is. So you're not going to be expected to simplify it down like this using these identities. If you can, that's awesome, but they're not going to expect you to. All right, now the next thing we need to look at calculus-wise with a polar graph is to find the area inside a polar graph. So the length of an arc in a circle is given by r times theta when theta is given in radians. That's the length of the arc. Now for a very small theta, the curve could be approximated by a straight line and the area could be found by using the triangle formula A equals one half base times height. So here is your r d theta. r times your change in theta gives you, that's what we had up here. That's going to be the arc length. And of course there's your radius. So we end up with the small change in area being one half base times height. And when we simplify that we're going to have one half r squared d theta. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that this is the area of one of these triangles, and if you're sweeping through a circular thing, what are you going to have? Think about a pizza. You're going to have a bunch of rectangles. So if this is the area of one rectangle, what do you think we're going to do to add up all the areas of all the rectangles? Well, what have we done over and over to add small parts multiple times? We've integrated. So we can use this to find the area inside a polar graph by doing the integral of that. So the area inside the polar graph is the integral from alpha to beta, beginning angle to ending angle of one half r squared d theta. Now guys, this keeps right along with everything that we've been expected when we have a dx we're expecting our upper and lower bounds to be in terms of x. Here the exact same way, if we have a d theta, we're expecting our upper and lower bounds here to be in terms of theta. That still holds true, and it has to. 
otherwise it doesn't work. So that is the simple way. Just think of the rectangle, uh, think of the triangle, and then what angle you're going from and to, and that's how you're going to integrate that. That's how you're going to find the area inside a polar graph. All right, so let's look at an example here. Find the area enclosed by r equals 2 times 1 plus cosine theta. All right, so we're starting at a theta of 0, and we're going to a theta of 2 pi. And the, the way we know that, we can actually plug some values in here. If we plug in 0, we're going to have 2 times 1 plus cosine of uh, 0 is 1. So 1 plus 1 gives us 2. 2 times 2, that's going to give you 4. So when we have a, an angle of 0, we're going to have a, a value of 4. And we're going to go all the way through, and there's going to be all the way back to 2 pi. Now, that's not always going to be the case, but you can actually value and prove that uh, by doing a couple of points along the way. You could do pi over 2 and value that and find out that it's going to be 2, because you have 2 times 1, and cosine of pi over 2 is 0. So that would give you that point right there. Uh, 0, or sorry, pi. If you did cosine pi, that's going to be negative 1, so 1 minus negative, or 1 plus negative 1 gives you 0, and 2 times 0 gives you 0. That's why we come back to the origin there. And then negative, or 3 pi over 2, that's going to give you a cosine value of 0, so you have 2 again. And then back to 2 pi is going to give you cosine of 2 pi is 1, 1 plus 1 gives you 2, 2 times 2 gives you 4. So you can actually see how that transfers around. Um, remember, we're just letting that thing uh, sweep through. Think about, when you think about a polar graph, guys, you really, really, really need to think about a radar display on the weather. What's happening is we're starting at zero and this thing right here is just sweeping around through your theta. Now don't worry about the fact that I'm, I'm, I can't keep the thing a solid, a stable length. Just know that you're going to go to pi over 4, calculate your r. You're going to go to pi over 2, calculate your r. You're going to go to 3 pi over 4, calculate your r. Ah, that's not what I wanted to do. Darn it. Going around to pi, calculate your r. Then you can move on around to uh, 5 pi over 4, 3 pi over 2, 7 pi over 4, 2 pi. You can be as detailed as you want with your graph or with those points that you choose, but all you're doing there is then just plugging those values in here to find out what the, how far out along that line you go. So, for instance, when I'm up here at pi over 4, let's say that's pi over 4. When I plug that in, cosine of pi over 4 is going to be square root of 2 over 2. Well, 1 plus the square root of 2 over 2 gives me a number. Uh, the square root of 2 is 1.4. Divide that by 2, it's going to be 0 0.7. So, 1 plus 0 0.7 gives me 1.7 times 2. So, that's going to be about 3.4 out that length, and that's where I would put a point. That's how a polar graph works. And I would do the exact same thing when I get up here to pi over 2. Well, like we said just a second ago, when I put pi over 2 in here, that's going to be 0, and 2 times 1 plus 0. 1 plus 0 gives you 1. 2 times 1 gives you 2. That's why we have a point of 2 right there. And you just do the same thing going all the way around. All right, that's enough of me rehashing over and over and over that. So now, we're going from 0 to 2 pi. That's how we figured that out, that we were going from 0 to 2 pi. And we're just going to integrate this after we plug everything in. So 2 times 1 plus cosine theta is going right here and being squared. And then we're going to uh, integrate that. So I've got 4 times 1 plus cosine theta, quantity squared. The 4 comes from the 2 squared. 1 plus cosine squared, or 1 plus cosine theta quantity squared comes from squaring this thing. 
All right, and then you're going to go ahead and multiply that out. It's going to make it a lot easier to deal with. And you can do a power uh, reduction formula right here. That gives you this thing. Once again, that's not something that you're going to have to know, but it's something that comes in useful when you're doing this. Now, you may need to know it when you go to college. So if you need to look at those uh, trig, fun trig identities, you definitely need to know power reduction and the double angle, and those, those are going to get you through a lot. And of course, the Pythagorean identities, and those are going to get you through a lot. Um, and so then when we get to this part right here, the twos are going to cancel out. And it's going to make things a lot easier for you to deal with. And then you can take the actual antiderivative. Evaluate it at 0 and evaluate it at 2 pi. And of course, do the subtraction. We plug in 2 pi, we're going to get uh, 6 pi. And we plug in 0, we're going to get 0. So the answer is 6 pi. That's the area enclosed by that figure right there. All right, some notes. To find the area between curves, you're going to subtract the same exact way we did with rectangular coordinates. Notice our, our uh, upper and lower bounds are still going to be our theta. We're still doing 1 half. We're doing r squared minus uh, little r squared. Now, just like finding the areas between the Cartesian curves, you've got to establish limits of integration where the curves cross, because you may have to swap your big R and your little r. And this is literally which function is the bigger r, the bigger radius, at the time, and which one is the smaller r. Before we talked about you know, the length, that was when we were rotating it around our uh, axis of rotation for our solids. This one's just for area but we still have a radius because we're talking about polar coordinates. All right, so let me give you an example here, or just a picture. So if we've got our line here, and let's say we've got, that is one of our curves. Don't laugh at my curves. Uh, don't laugh at my graph here. And then we've got one that goes like this. And we're doing the area that's enclosed by both of these curves. So we want this part right here. Well, how would you go about doing this? Well, notice that until you get to here, you're not going to actually take that. So that would be one place where you would start your graph. And you're going to do the sweep all the way through to where it ends up over here. So that's the theta. So here's your theta 1, your alpha and here's your beta. Now, what is our equation? Well, remember, we're only looking for where it's enclosed in both, so we're actually looking for this is our big R and this is our little r. That's not the best one to, gr to graph like, like that. Let's, let's do something really simple. Um, let's do two circles. <clears throat> All right, those aren't exactly the same uh, center, but you get the idea. Let me change the colors on one of these. So if we wanted to find the area in quadrant one that's enclosed between these two, that's in between these two, of course we could do that using circles. Now don't get me wrong, that would be the easier way of doing this. But if you're having to use polar, this thing is a dream with polar because what do we know? It's just r is this and r is that. r is 4 and r is 2. And you integrate that 2 from, if we're doing from quadrant 1, we're do integrating from 0 to pi over 2. But that's the idea. You're going to do the biggest radius, the one that has the longest length from the origin, minus the one that has the shorter length to the origin. So this is the, cal this is the value we're actually using as we're swaying through, and this is actually making almost like a, a, a dull pot slice. Because we're doing this all the way to the middle, remember? So you've got the big one, and then you're taking away the little one. 
So you're actually finding the area of this thing over and over and over and adding them all together. Now, when finding an area, negative values of r are going to cancel out. So with this one, we have r equals 2 sine 2 theta. Well, if we go from 0 to 2 pi, we're going to have some instances where your r is going to end up being negative and somewhere it's going to be positive. So the area of one leaf is the best way to find this and then multiply that times 4. Because as we go from 0 to 2 theta, we're actually going from, with this angle, we're going from what? We're going to from 0 to 4 theta. So we want to actually get in here and find this. And so we're integrating from 0 to pi over 2. And we have 4 times 1 half of the integral from 0 to pi over 2. And we're integrating 2 sine 2 theta, quantity squared, with respect to theta. And when we find that, we're going to find that it's 2 theta. Now that's the area of one leaf, and then we multiply it times 4, this 4 right here. And then the area of four leaves, we could actually go from 0 to 2 pi and do the one half thing, r theta. And we're still going to find that it's 2 pi. All right, now to find the length of a curve along a uh, polar coordinate or a cur polar curve, remember that the small distance is equal to the small value of x change squared plus the small value of y change squared. So for polar graphs, remember that x is r cosine theta and y is r sine theta. We talked about that just a second ago while that's true. So if we find the derivatives and plug them into the formula, we will eventually, with some simplification, get this that the derivative, or sorry, the small length of curve is equal to the square root of r squared plus dr d theta quantity squared integrated with respect, or times d theta. And the thing is we end up having to multiply by d theta all the way through and that's, that's where this comes from. We have to multiply all the way through by d theta squared over d theta squared. Uh, and that's where this comes from. That's why we get the d theta inside. No, sorry, inside we multiply by d theta squared over d theta squared. That's where this has no d. Anyway, don't worry about it. Uh, just trust me that that is the equation. So the length is actually the integral of that, which adds up all the little parts. So we're integrating from alpha to beta of the square root of r squared plus dr d theta quantity squared d theta. where r is, once again, just the way that you're defining the function. And then the derivative of that thing with respect to theta, quantity squared, put those together and integrate it. And most of these guys you're going to have, you're going to be able to do these with a calculator because a lot of these are going to be really difficult uh, integrals to do by hand. And a lot of times they'll have you just set them up. They won't actually have you solve them. So that's why it's important to know these equations because sometimes all you got to do is set it up and you'll get a point for the integrand, what's inside and in, in here, uh, maybe a point for the bounds, you know, and, and it'll be an easy couple of points for you to get. And this right here is very important to remember as well. That's kind of why I drilled it into you and, and uh, worked on it so hard to try to explain where that comes from before. All right, now, there is also a surface area equation similar to the others that we're already familiar with. And let me go ahead and tell you, you will not have to use it. Now, notice, well, hold on. I don't think you have to use it.
It's not a bad idea to remember anyway. Because here's the thing. Notice, if you remember the length of the arc right here, what's the only thing we're multiplying by? 2 pi y, which is nothing more than the circumference of a circle. So the circumference of a circle times the length of the arc, and that's going to give you the, the barrel, essentially, the curvy barrel thing that contains this. This is not finding a volume, though. It's just finding the surface area. So learn the length, and notice your alpha and beta stayed the same. It's just whatever you're integrating from and to. And then all you're doing for surface area is multiplying 2 pi y. Now, it's always going to be 2 pi y. Now, and your y is nothing more than r sine theta. So now we have this thing expressed in terms of nothing but r's and thetas. So 2 pi r sine theta, and that get, and times the, the length. Integrate that, and that's going to give you the surface area of the equation, or uh, surface area of the, the polar graph. All right, that's it.